Hello dear students, welcome to Endocrinology again. In this session, we are going to deal with various problems related to water and sodium control. So, the problems with water and sodium balance that we are going to deal in this lecture are diabetes insipidus, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion and cerebral salt wasting. Coming to osmoregulation. What is osmoregulation? For this, we must know what is the normal osmolality of the serum or of the blood. The control of the osmolality is very important because the osmolality of the blood is maintained in a very narrow range and that is from 285 to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram. The unit of osmolality is milliosmoles per kilogram. And this narrow range is maintained by various mechanisms and these are osmoregulatory mechanisms. Water and sodium are controlled in a unique way in the body. Sodium controls the water and water controls the sodium. In short, the hypothalamus is the one which controls the water but the trigger is the solute load or the salt load in the blood. The kidneys control the salt but the trigger is the volume or the water in the GFR or the ultrafiltrate. So in turn they regulate each other uh, in a very unique or in a very special manner. So we have anterior hypothalamus which has got sensors and the sensors are outside the blood brain barrier in the contact of the smallest capillaries and they can sense the changes in the osmolality of the blood and in response to increase in the osmolality anterior hypothalamus produces vasopressin it is then carried up to the posterior pituitary and stored and released anterior hypothalamus also gets various inputs from the baroreceptors in the neck so in stretching of the baroreceptors is the clue towards increased blood volume and also there are some clues from the aldosterone pathway so clues from the kidney as well. This vasopressin or also called as antidiuretic hormone it goes in the circulation and it reaches the V2 receptors of the collecting tubule cells and it binds the receptors it activates the cyclic AMP pathway and thus makes the aquaporin 2 channels available on the cell surface and these channels are responsible for absorption of the free water. So the water is reclaimed from the collecting tubules using this V2 receptor mediated aquaporin channels. Vasopressin and thirst are two independent yet related mechanisms. Vasopressin it helps in the tight regulation of the osmolality and it is such a sensitive mechanism that even 1% change in the osmolality triggers the vasopressin mechanism and it is very sensitive. So before even the thirst is thirst mechanism is activated the vasopressin is already active. So the threshold for thirst is at a higher level as compared to vasopressin. The half-life or the activity in the blood circulation for vasopressin is only 15 minutes that gives immediate effect and immediate change in the urine osmolality and thereby blood osmolality. Osmolality is the solute load in the blood and how is it measured? It is measured by either direct or indirect method. The direct method is either freezing point depression method or vapor pressure depression method but it is not commonly available so the commonly used method is by calculating and the formula that is used is 2 into sodium plus glucose divided by 18 plus blood urea nitrogen divided by 2.8 so if we are using milli equivalents for sodium and milligrams per dl for glucose and bun we get the calculated osmolality by this formula Coming to diabetes insipidus. Diabetes is the clinical description of polyuria. Malitis is when the urine is honey-like and insipidus is when the urine is bland or very dilute. So that was the old clinical description. Diabetes insipidus is the inability to reabsorb the water through the renal tubules due to vasopressin deficiency or lack of its effect on the receptors. 
So we can have problems at either the central level where the vasopressin is not getting formed and released or we can have a receptor resistance at the kidneys where there is a problem in the ADH action or vasopressin action on its receptors. So various causes are commonly asked in the multiple choice questions. So central diabetes insipidus is caused by any CNS insult such as head injury, any tumors like craniopharyngioma, histiocytosis, pituitary surgery and Wolfram syndrome. Wolfram syndrome you must remember from our diabetes chapter from pediatric section. We have a combination of diabetes mellitus, diabetes insipidus, optic dystrophy and hearing deficit. So please remember Didmod syndrome or Wolfram syndrome is a cause or uh, an etiology for diabetes insipidus. Nephrogenic diabetes is either congenital or acquired because of the drugs and the drugs that commonly cause nephrogenic DI are lithium, amphotericin B, rifampicin and aminoglycosides. Diabetes insipidus presents with polyuria and polydipsia and there are many other conditions which can mimic diabetes insipidus for example psychogenic or compulsive polydipsia that is as a habit disorder or as a psychological disorder one may have compulsive water drinking so we have to differentiate diabetes insipidus from the other causes such as primary polydipsia or psychogenic polydipsia so how do we do that if we have a clear cut history of CNS insult associated with dilute urine and hypernatremia the diagnosis is central diabetes insipidus if we have on lab evaluation if the serum osmolality is above 300 urine osmolality is below 300 it confirms the diagnosis of diabetes insipidus but in clinical practice most of the times the diagnosis is not clear cut and we have values somewhere in in between so the serum osmolality may be lingering around 290 to 295 or the urine osmolality is not picking up so we have a test for diagnosis of diabetes insipidus and it is called as water deprivation test so in water deprivation test it is done in two parts first is we deprive the water and see the body's response normally we would expect that after water deprivation the ADH should get activated and secreted it should act on the kidneys and slowly the urine output should reduce and the urine should become more and more concentrated and this is the body's effort to maintain normal blood osmolality so this is the kind of response we are looking for we achieve the dehydration up to 5% of the weight loss or we measure serial serum osmolalities and the end point is when the serum osmolality goes above 300 so this is the time we have achieved adequate dehydration and we look for the urinary osmolality at this time and in diabetes insipidus we expect that the urine is dilute even when the serum osmolality is above 300 so this is our diagnosis when we have achieved or when we have made the diagnosis of diabetes insipidus now is the time we should differentiate between central versus nephrogenic so how do we do that we give vasopressin and we see the response in central diabetes insipidus there is gradual rise in the urinary osmolality because the exogenous vasopressin that we have given subcutaneously is now acting on the kidneys and thereby achieving urine concentration but in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus this response is not seen if we perform MRI imaging in a case of diabetes insipidus in most of the central diabetes insipidus the normal posterior pituitary bright spot is not seen so it is absent in most of the central DI however in rare cases of nephrogenic DI because of the exhaustion of the pituitary gland we can have absent pituitary bright spot the typical triple response seen in CNS injury is initial period of diabetes insipidus and that lasts for around 48 hours and that is because of the edema and that inhibits the release of vasopressin from the neurons it is soon followed by the second phase which is SIADH and that is due to release of vasopressin from the dying neurons and this is the phase where we have oliguria and hyponatremia and it is soon replaced within 7 to 10 days by a permanent diabetes insipidus because there are no longer any neurons left to produce vasopressin. Treatment of DI in central DI one has to ascertain if 
this is a transient DI or acute onset DI or it's a chronic DI. If we have an operated case of craniopharyngioma who has been having polyuria for last three months, four months, this is the kind of case who is having permanent diabetes insipidus. So here we can start directly on analog of vasopressin, which is a long-acting analog, desmopressin or DDAVP. It is to be given intranasally as a spray and it is to be given at the bedtime so that the nighttime frequency of urination is reduced and the patient can have a sound sleep. But if we have acute history of uh, polyuria and there is a setting of head injury or some CNS insult, one may like to wait and see the response of the patient so we can replace the urinary losses with excess fluid and we we will monitor the sodiums and wait for spontaneous recovery. If the urine output is very much in excess, we can give a short lasting vasopressin uh, that is aqueous vasopressin and that is given as subcutaneous injections. Nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, uh, the mainstay treatment is adequate water intake because the kidneys are unable to reclaim the free water. Thiazide diuretics are of some help and they work by two mechanisms. They firstly increase the vasopressin independent aquaporins in the collective tubule. So they help in reclaiming some of the fluid. And secondly, they are diuretics. So they cause shrinkage of the ECF. And as ECF is sh shrunken, we have a reduction in the GFR and thereby reducing the urine output. So thiazides are of some help in nephrogenic diabetes. Primary polydipsia, it is the abnormal thirst mechanism that is giving rise to compulsive water drinking and the polyuria is secondary to the excessive water intake. It is seen in habit disorders and psychiatric disorders as well and the key features here are the kidneys are having a normal concentrating mechanism. So if we withhold the fluid, eventually the kidneys start concentrating the urine. So water deprivation test helps in distinguishing between DI and psychogenic or primary polydipsia. SIADH or syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. So ADH is secreted in excessive amounts. So vasopressin is active on the collecting tubules and we have water retention and thereby causing dilutional hyponatremia. So SIADH, the key features are there is no evidence of dehydration. In fact, the patient is euvolemic or in fact hypervolemic. So we can have bounding pulses, blood pressures are normal to borderline high. If we perform urinary sodium, the urinary sodiums will be elevated. And we have serum sodiums which are low, so we have dilutional hyponatremia. So euvolemic or hypervolemic patient, hyponatremia and elevated urinary sodiums in a setting of CNS injury, you have the diagnosis of SIADH. But there are many causes other than CNS injury. For example, if we have carcinomas of the bronchus, pancreatic carcinoma, GI carcinomas, if we have acute lung injury or pneumonia, these patients can also have excessive ADH secretion because of the stress and we can have associated hyponatremia. Drugs such as anticonvulsants like carbamazepine, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and oral hypoglycemics such as chlorpropamide or tolbutamide are also important causes to be remembered with reference to SIADH. The clinical features we have already seen hypovolemia, bounding pulses, mild facial puffiness and the key feature here is oliguria and concentrated urine. Please remember there is another entity, cerebral salt wasting, which, which we will be discussing in the subsequent slides. These patients also have hyponatremia. These patients also have CNS injury. But the differentiating feature is in SIADH, you have oliguria and in cerebral salt wasting, you have polyuria. The volume status in SIADH is normal, whereas in cerebral salt wasting, they are dehydrated and hypovolemic. We have to rule out thyroid adrenal disorders because they can also cause free water retention before labeling a patient to be having SIADH. Lab criteria, hyponatremia less than 135 milli equivalents per liter, low sodium osmolality usually below 275, urinary osmolality inappropriately high for the serum osmolality and by inappropriately high I mean when a patient is having low 
serum osmolality he is expected to pass a dilute urine to get rid of the free water but here instead of passing a dilute urine the patient is passing inappropriately concentrated urine so the osmolality of the urine is inappropriately high for the given serum osmolality treatment of siadh is volume restriction so siadh presents with oliguria and the first reflex when we see any patient with oliguria is to give fluid bolus so siadh is one condition where you would worsen the case if you give extra fluids so one has to be very cautious siadh volume restriction and how much volume do we give if you calculate the minimum uh, solute load excretion and the urine volume that is required for this minimum solute load excretion it is 500 ml per meter square and you have additional 500 ml per meter square as insensible water loss so total of 1000 ml per meter square is the fluid that you can safely give to a patient with siadh so moderate fluid restriction monitoring the vitals such as blood pressure monitor the urine output and most importantly don't forget to monitor sodium acute severe hyponatremia or symptomatic hyponatremia is when we have associated coma or seizures here we can give frusemide as a rescue measure but please remember frusemide would cause natriuresis and also free water loss so we have to replace the sodium so we give frusemide along with hypertonic saline other therapies such as demeclocycline and lithium are sometimes used in siadh please remember demeclocycline and lithium are the drugs that cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus so we have a excessive adh and we are trying to overcorrect or rather we are trying to correct it by causing nephrogenic diabetes insipidus so demeclocycline and lithium please remember they are used as a treatment for siadh coming to the last entity cerebral salt wasting here we have the problem in the cns any cns injury insult tumor infection trauma surgery or hydrocephalus this insult gives rise to increase in atrial natriuretic peptide hormone or anp hormone and this anp hormone in turn reduces the adh concentration and the problem in cerebral salt wasting is the patient is losing salt and he is also losing water so he has polyuria associated with hyponatremia so we have polyuria polydipsia in cerebral salt wasting and diabetes insipidus you have common features of polyuria and polydipsia especially when the patient is conscious and the thirst is intact clinically they will have signs of hypovolemia dehydration similar to diabetes insipidus but the differentiating feature here is presence of hyponatremia so we have dehydration along with hyponatremia so hyponatremia is like siadh if we perform urinary sodium they will be very high because the patient is practically losing high amounts of sodium in the urine so the the concentration is more than 150 and they have depressed levels of vasopressin if, if we perform the assay in the serum the treatment here is replenishment of sodium and water and treat the primary condition So in this last slide I have compiled the features of SIADH versus cerebral salt wasting so please spend a couple of minutes on this slide the body weight is increased in SIADH but as the patient is dehydrated in cerebral salt wasting the body weight is expected to be low plasma volume is increased in SIADH reduced in cerebral salt wasting serum sodium and body weight move in opposite directions in SIADH whereas they move in the same direction in salt wasting urine osmolality is higher than the serum in siadh but it is equal to the serum in cases of cerebral salt wasting urinary sodium is very high in cerebral salt wasting uh, uric acid levels and blood urea creatinine and also hematocrit values are all reduced in cases of siadh and you can guess correctly because they are volume overloaded everything gets diluted so you get reduced values of these bio biochemical and hematological parameters but in cases of cerebral salt wasting the uric acid may be variable and bu creat and hematocrit is invariably increased this table would help you in differentiating between these two confusing entities and with this we come to the end of this session of water and sodium imbalance happy studying thank you